is actually a couch concert tonight. Looks like uh, we just hit $3,000 in donations. I'm really trying not to cry right now, so I'm incredibly proud. She's, she's worked really hard. They helped me when I was starting out, so, you know, it's just my way to give back to them. We've had it for over 20 years and just couldn't figure out what it was. During this pandemic, we are getting overloaded with a lot of information. It can be a lot to take in from time to time. So it's easy to miss something that might be important or something that might have made you smile from the past week. So during this 530 newscast, we want to share some of the stories from the week just in case you missed it. We start with a series of stories that were put together as part of a collaboration between 20 different news organizations across the state. They show us a day in the life of a Coloradan on one particular day, and that day is April 16th. And we know this is a stressful time for many, but for homes where there might be domestic violence before the pandemic, this stress can be unbearable. At the crossroads of Safe House in Fort, or Crossroads Safe House in Fort Collins, the work is now more important than ever. Nine o'clock, um, just arrived here at Crossroads Safe House. Man, I'm just gonna sign in and start the day. My name is Erica. I am the Shelter and Outreach Manager of Crossroads Safe House in Fort Collins. 9.47 a.m. An email came in from one of my teammates um, that she needs a DART form. With COVID-19, a lot of our programs have really had to change a little bit. Um, they all still exist, um, but as part of our prevention efforts and keeping everyone safe, both victims and volunteers and staff, we are no longer responding to the scene as we would have in the past. And now we are um, contacting all victims via phone um, to reach out and provide support and talk about next steps. It is 11, 12 a.m. Just thought I would show you some of our increased signage um, about the stay at home order and different prevention efforts for COVID-19 and how to stay safe here in the building. It's 11.48. I'm just going to remove all of the dirty linens and uh, other things and trash so that we can disinfect the room and open it up for somebody else here soon. People should only be going out for essential activities, but we do have residents who have essential activities. So in particular, there's one resident who needs to go to court today to be there um, for filing for her protection order and her abusive partner is likely also to be there. So it isn't something that she can choose not to do. <laughs> yeah, success. Uh, we were able to help shovel uh, the resident out so that she can go uh, to court. And okay, 114 and just came in from uh, shoveling a few residents out of the snow. 452, the phones recently with the pandemic have just really been uh, ringing off the hook. Yeah, so we are seeing an increase for sure in domestic violence and intimate partner abuse just because people aren't working, they're, you know, stuck at home and um, also abusive partners now are, this is this whole abusive relationships are all about power and control, right? And so there's this whole other huge aspect now of this abusive person's life that is completely out of control. And so of course we're going to start to see them trying to exert control over, uh, over the victim. In addition to that, uh, I've been getting a lot of calls from people who are just seeking shelter because there aren't a lot of safe places to go right now with space for the homeless population. Other thing that we're seeing is an increase in really high risk cases or cases, callers who are um, potentially at risk of being killed by their abusive partners. We just don't have the space to take, um, to take all of the people who need us right now. 7.03. PM. Our resident who went to court today um, and who we helped dig out of the snow uh, so that she could get her car out and go to court um, was granted her permanent protection order. Her abusive partner did not show up. 741. Thought I was done, but uh, forgot. There's actually a couch concert tonight. Looks like uh, we just hit $3,000 in donations. So thanks, everybody. 
Muslims around the world are celebrating Ramadan, the holy month when followers fast and spend more time in prayer. But how that prayer looks has been changed by COVID-19. One Imam shared just how different Ramadan is this year. Well, this place used to hold up to like 200 people, but right now it's empty. One of the main objectives and one of the main missions of this mosque is to provide a safe space for people to come and pray and connect with their God. This watch used to tell us about the times of the five daily prayers. With each time of these, people used to come, 40 or 35 people come to each one of these prayers. The mosque used to be open all the way one hour and a half before the sun rises, all the way two or three hours after the sunset. But now we're closed all the time. The physical space of the mosque as a holy place for Muslims to come and pray and connect for God. And their prayers is multiplied by 27 if they pray in a mosque in a group. This is gone. One of the things that I really miss about community before coronavirus is that sense of belonging and sense of, uh, of human interactions, physical interactions. One of the main things Islam focuses on is the concept of striving, the concept of um, perseverance, and the concept of uh, connection and intimate connection between the human being and, the God, and God. And these are the main concepts right now that I'm trying to focus on. This is why we are creating and crafting a whole series of Ramadan to make sure that people are reviving their hearts and make sure that people are connecting naturally. So right now I'm working on the Ramadan program. This is the schedule of last Ramadan 2019. Every day there's something. But unfortunately, this year, that's what our schedule. It's just like nothing but making sure that we provide everything that we can to the people who are needed. Well, our main goals is to make sure that this mosque is providing the, spirit, the financial assistance and the charity work and community service and community engagement. God judges us to our intentions and our efforts, not the results. So if we have good intentions and we lack all the resources, but we have good intentions and we do our, our best to pray and to make sure that we pray in group, we get the same reward as if we pray here in the mosque. 5280 Magazine profiled a Colorado flight attendant who, through a series of video diaries, took us through what it's like to fly through COVID-19. I'm a flight attendant for United. I've been a flight attendant for a year and a half. Good morning. I'm here in my hotel in Charleston. It's about 8.40 a.m. We are working Charleston to Washington's Dulles. Uh, we fly Dulles to Denver. It's day two of our trip. Uh, yesterday we did Denver to Chicago. We had a long sit there, then Chicago to Charleston. So we had a 12-hour layover. We're heading to the airport and uh, come along for a day in the life. So we just got through security. There's not a single person in the security line and there's like nobody in the airport, so. We just arrived in uh, Washington, Dallas. Uh, off our planes here. That's pretty crazy. Uh, when we were landing, all the planes are parked um, out on the airfield, which is just incredible to see our fleet just parked. Um, we had only about 12 people out of 50 seats on our last like 12 people booked. Now it's time to head to the hotel for a little bit of R&R &R since we have such a long set. It's another thing is hotels have been extremely empty. It's just been weird now it's kind of normal to have like nobody around in a hotel. So a long sit is a sit that is over four hours. Um, with it being over four hours contractually by United and our AFA union, um, the company has to get us a hotel for that long sit. Because of the schedules being reduced so much as a flight attendant now, everything is um, everything's just been modified a lot more than what it normally is, but it's allowing us at least um, just a chance to like chill out between flights. Normally we do have crew rooms um, that we can go and sleep in, 
Unfortunately, the company has closed all the crew rooms due to Corona. They don't want the spread going around, obviously. Um, but at least this way I can get like a little bit of a nap in. So I'm gonna get going to my gate. Um, I gotta be to the aircraft. I'm gonna get on, do my safety checks, do everything else that I need to do as a flight attendant. But we're just adding a little extra. Um, we're just making sure everything's sanitized that needs to be sanitized before we get on the aircraft. Um, and then uh, making sure we get our own gloves on and um, we change out those gloves very frequently, washing our hands. Um, you know, the company is allowing us to wear face masks now, which is great. Got our N95s, our surgical mask, kind of preference, whoever, but mostly stay with these, but for me, my glasses. Um, and gloves, and then Lysol wipes are back of the plane. So right now, service is kind of pretty basic. All we're doing is just handing out cans. Uh, no more cups, no ice. Uh, we're eliminating the point of contact, but we at least have uh, service for everybody. We no longer have iced coffee, juices or tea, um, orange juice actually, specifically. Um, but it's helping us um, protect our customers better from what we're uh, trying to um, try to defeat the coronavirus. So. Yeah, I'm kind of worried about catching it. You know, I'm more worried about um, my family gets more higher risk. That's where I get kind of worried about any of the uh, sickness or anything. We just made it to Denver. Uh, pretty quiet flight. Uh, service is normal. Nowadays, usually people don't want anything to drink on the planes. Um, they're just being like really cautious about stuff. But I'm not worried. Um, eventually we'll get over it. And it's just day by day by day as we go, so. All of those stories are part of the statewide collab project. Uh, it's a reporting project, Colorado's COVID Diaries, a day in the pandemic. You can find more of those stories right now on 9news.com. No high school graduation, but one photographer gives seniors the praise they have earned. Spreading the, the word of safety and PPE for everybody, you know. And this artist finds a way to promote health through art. Welcome back as we take a look at some of the stories you may have missed this week. High school seniors would normally be graduating right now. They are missing out on a lot of milestones because of this pandemic. Many of them will not get the celebration they deserve. But our Katie Eastman found a photographer who is finding a way to celebrate with them while also keeping her business alive. Creativity at work comes easy to Aaron Cox. It's really sad for us because I love what I do and I love photographing my families. But when COVID-19 stopped her work, it's non-existent. Aaron got creative in a different way. If you would have told me two months ago that I would be making yard signs, hundreds of yard signs, delivering them and then shipping them across the United States, I would have said you're crazy. Crazy worked out. 
and now her senior portraits adorn Louisville yards and beyond. Turns out Aaron's pivot in business was just what the moms of high school seniors needed. I'm really trying not to cry right now, so <laughs> I'm incredibly proud. She's she's worked really hard. Thank you. Emma Luckner <laughs> was supposed to graduate in two weeks. Slowly everything just kind of got canceled and now we're here. Here in the front yard celebrating. It's the only place they can. And to scream out to the world that she accomplished so much uh, was very important to us. It's not the scream they would have let out on graduation day, but all around town, Neighbors can see the shouts. Aaron has sold more than 100 signs. Awesome, go see! Kai Martin's senior year ended suddenly too. I mean, it's like a shock. So we get creative, right? And and we do something different. So a yard really sign will have to do for now. He has compassion and a really great heart. Um, and he's super smart, you know? I have the smartest kid. <laughs> She's gonna go out there and conquer the world. <laughs> We hope <laughs> she can do anything. Parents will always be proud. And Erin like created a way for them to show it. It's thinking outside the box to bring community together, to help our business at the same time. In Louisville, Katie Eastman, Nine News. Boulder Valley schools, where both Emma and Kai go, have postponed their graduation ceremonies through July. If you are interested in a yard sign for your senior, we have Erin's information in this story on our website. In case you missed it, there is an artist in Denver working to help restaurants survive the temporary shutdown caused by the coronavirus pandemic. Our Jordan Chavez learned he's actually returning the favor because those restaurants gave him some of his very first business in the Mile High City. His work is recognizable from a distance. Large scale, colorful paintings of man's best friend. That's kind of my thing. Everybody knows me as the bull bulldog guy. They're usually of Patrick Kane McGregor's own pet, but now. That was the first dog with a mask. These murals have an even bigger meaning. Spreading the, the word of safety and PPE for everybody, you know. This one's of Winston, a pug in North Carolina. This was just a spur of the moment thing, but I looked in the, in the news and there's a, the first dog that got the coronavirus. Patrick's art does more than raise awareness. It's helping to build income for the businesses he paints on. We're making lemonade here. Like Casey Carnes restaurant in Rhino, which is completely shut down during the pandemic. So that's that's basically the only income we have right now is the art. Meadow Art Kitchen was one of the first places who supported Patrick's art. It's a nice juicy burger. I mean, look at it. Now he's using profits from prints of his work to help them stay afloat. Uh, I think we've sold about $7,000 worth of art so far. They helped me when I was starting out, so, you know, it's just my way to give back to them. Patrick hasn't started selling prints of his masked dogs, and he's hoping he never has to. Hopefully we'll get out of this thing and I won't have to paint any more dogs with masks and take the mask off. <laughs> Jordan Chavez, 9 News. The human mind, the human condition is still to be curious. And this skeleton had researchers' curiosity for two decades why they call it the crazy beast.
Welcome back. From graduates to scientists, Katie Eastman shared a few great stories from across Colorado this week, including the discovery of the crazy beast, a bizarre historic mammal found by the senior curator of vertebrae paleontology at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. He told Katie this is his biggest discovery yet. Skeletons in your office might not be something to brag about. Yeah, we have it all. But Dr. David Krauss is all proud of this replica. It's amazingly complete. One that will be in the Denver Museum of Nature and Science as soon as it opens back up. Museums are built around discovery and curiosity. And uh, coronavirus has dominated the news, and appropriately so. Uh, but the human mind, the human condition is still to be curious. Curiosity about mammals in Madagascar has consumed this paleontologist's career. An article about this one, published in the Journal of Nature today, is his biggest discovery yet. This is, in fact, the most complete and best preserved skeleton from the entire Mesozoic, which is 186 million years long, from the entire southern hemisphere. So. Uh, it truly is a, an important discovery. This is a dolotherium. That translates to crazy beast because scientists have been stumped by its strange features. We've had it for over 20 years and just couldn't figure out what it was. The badger-like creature has teeth unlike any other mammal. Its front legs act like a mammal, but its back is like a reptile. And then there's the hole on the top of its snout. And to be honest, we are totally mystified by it. The adolotherium lived 66 million years ago. This one was likely buried alive, but there is no evidence it has any ancestors. Scientists say the species may have perished along with the dinosaurs. Uh, there is so much to discover in Madagascar still. I think we've really just gotten to the tip of the iceberg. Even now, curiosity cannot be stopped. Katie Eastman, Nine News. The Denver Museum of Nature and Science has 20,000 plus specimens from Dr. Krause's 25 plus years in Madagascar. Only 12 of them are from mammals and most of them are just fragments. You'll be able to learn more about the crazy beast. I love that name, Steve, the crazy beast. And you can see the replica of the skeleton at the museum when it reopens. It is the soap opera we didn't know we needed. The Eagle drama coming up at Stanley Lake. The much-watched eagles at Stanley Lake have had a hot and heavy thing going on for more than a year now. And this year, there is a lot of drama that our show, Next with Kyle Clark, has been actively following through all this. Mama and Papa Eagle were chilling in their nests, watching over three eggs, when earlier this month, a new woman came into the picture. And by that, I mean a female eagle. 
she attacked the nest. The Stanley Lake wildlife manager's best guess is that mama eagle left home to re recover somewhere else. This is actually typical for eagles, but sadly the eggs are not expected to hatch now. But wait, there's more. Papa Eagle has been living with the new Lady Eagle in, in, in the nest there. The wildlife manager has named the new eagle F420, female April 2020. Eagles normally lay eggs in late April, hatching in late May or early June, so it's unlikely the pair for all of their very visible efforts will produce eggs this year. And Stanley Lake's wildlife manager said that they get pretty attached to their eagles, but they call this the circle of life, said F420 is not a nest wrecker by any means. She's just trying to survive this whole thing. You can expect to see any new eagle mama drama as it unfolds on Next with Kyle Clark weeknights at six o'clock. <laughs> If uh, TV news doesn't work out for you, Steve, you may have a career in soap opera narration. Soap opera voiceovers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm working on it. I'm, I'm putting a tape together for that, just in Excellent. case. Excellent. It's all the time uh, we have. We'll see you back here. This has been fun. We should do this next week. <laughs>